Cashflow Diary Podcast, Episode 133. Welcome to yet another exciting episode of the Cashflow Diary Podcast. The podcast that teaches you insider tips, tactics, and strategies for creating leverage streams of cash flow into your life. Learn from top performing entrepreneurs, business owners, investors, and thought leaders from across the globe as they share their secrets to success. Like what you learn on this and other Cash Flow Diary podcast episodes? Go to learninvestingnow.com and sign up to receive powerful tips and information that will help you succeed as an entrepreneur and investor. Now, here's your host, investor, entrepreneur, business owner, educator, speaker, author, and master facilitator of Robert Kiyosaki's cash flow game, Jay Massey. All right, and welcome to another episode of the Cashflow Diary Podcast. I am your host, Jay Massey, and I am absolutely excited because you guys have heard me say a number of times, and I'm going to say it one more time just in case you haven't, you do not have a money problem. You have an idea problem, and many of us could solve our money problem if we were willing to gain access to other people's ideas and then just flat plain execute on them. Today's guest has done exactly that. It's not about how much money you have. It's how you use what you have to get what you need so you can have what you want. And he's done that. And that's what's amazing about today's guest. Because hear this, with only $500 in capital, he was able to build a brand that you already know. Have you seen those boots? You know, UGG. Yeah, that's who we're talking to today. None other than Brian Smith, the founder of the world-famous UGG Australia brand. He graduated in 1978 as a chartered accountant in Australia and came to California. I call that a good move because I love the weather out here. Looking for the next big opportunity to bring back to Australia. He's recently authored a book, The Birth of a Brand, that is now live in Amazon and is sought after. It is a sought-after keynote speaker and mentors small business owners. So. I know something today. You're going to see the power of one idea. Welcome, Brian Smith. Brian, you there? Hey, Jay. Nice to be on your show. Thank you. You are quite welcome, and I am glad that you have taken the time to be here. Now, as the audience knows, you may not know, we tend to start with the same question because I got to know. I look at you know today's entrepreneurs a lot like yesterday's superheroes. You know, Batman, Robin, and I don't know if Australians had oh. a special uh, <laughs> I uh, live up to that <laughs> su- superhero or anything. But you, I think we do live up to that as entrepreneurs. I think that's what we do. We put on, you know, our, our superhero pants and tights and whatever, and we go out there and we take on other people's problems. That's what superheroes do. I mean, if I'm in a bur- burning building, I probably want Spider-Man to come by and at least, if I have to jump, I want him to, you know, spread a web so that I can land on it. That would be very, very great. I I'd be very happy for that. Now, before Spider-Man was Spider-Man, Superman, Superman, Wonder Woman was what she was. Here's the point. They all have an origin. They all started somewhere. Maybe they got bit by a spider or maybe they got some, you know, their planet exploded. But my question to you is, before you were the founder of UGG, yeah. what, I, what I would love to know is who is Brian Smith? Okay, well, let's go all the way back then. I, I was uh, working as an accountant in Australia, and uh, I, I really didn't like it. But I didn't, I didn't get an education pass at you know, my high school to go to college, so I had to find a job in the meantime. And accounting was it. And I thought I could, you know, graduate in four years by going to night school. Well, that took ten years, and the day I graduated is the day I quit. Being an accountant, I gave my notice, <laughs> and uh, it was quite a while, you know, a month or two, trying to figure out what I was going to do. And I had just opened the the new album uh, "Dark Side of the Moon" by Pink Floyd. I'm sure you've heard of that. I have. And uh, the words in it were, were that I heard were "Tired of lying in the sunshine, staying home to watch the rain. You are young, and life is long, and there is time to kill today." And I, and I thought. Oh my God, he's talking about me. And then it went on. But but then you find one day 10 years have got behind you. No one told you when to run. You missed the starting gun. And I just got goosebumps. And I thought, oh my 
God, that <laughs> I, I've missed the starting gun. All my friends are gone. You know, they're tracking to partnerships or whatever, started their own businesses, and I'd done nothing for 10 years. So just within a couple of days, I, I was meditating and figured out, you know, all the trends are coming from California, you know, water beds, Levi jeans, surf clothing brands, all that stuff. And so I said, I'm going to go to California and find the next big thing to bring back. And I was in California for four, maybe two or three months, still hadn't found it until I was you know, going to go surfing up at Malibu one day. And my buddy was down. He brought a copy of the new surfer magazine and I flicked through it and I got goosebumps again because I saw a photo of these pairs of legs up in front of a fireplace with sheepskin boots on and I went, oh, my God, there's no sheepskin boots in America. And <laughs> it seemed like one in two Australians owned a pair at, at that time. So so that's the answer of you know how I, how I got here and how I started the Ugg boot business was by seeing that ad. And a buddy of mine and I borrowed $500, which was our first capital, and we sent down for some samples. So that that's who I was. I was never trained as an entrepreneur. I never really had any ideas to be one. I just acted out of default because I didn't want to be an accountant. <laughs> you hated it that much, so you yeah. decided to build a multi-million dollar international enterprise instead. I thought it would be <laughs> overnight, yeah. Oh, well, you know, we it, it only takes about, what, 17 years to be overnight success? <laughs> yeah. My problem was that I, you know, um, it takes a certain amount of ignorance or, or innocence to become an entrepreneur, to be a good entrepreneur, because if you knew all the obstacles ahead of you, you would never start. And so, <laughs> so I was ignorant that Americans don't get sheepskin like Australians do. You know, they think it's delicate and you can't get it wet, you can't get it muddy, it's going to be hot, it's going to be, you know, prickly. And whereas Australians just know how rugged and comfortable it is and it, it always keeps your foot, at temp your foot temperature. So the first few... Uh, road trips I did to the shoe stores got zero response. It's California. They're going, why are you trying to bring sheepskin here? It never gets cold. Right. But, but it never got cold in Australia either. So I, I went to a shoe show in New York thinking maybe they'll have a different attitude. And in three days at this little trade show I was at, not a single person spoke to me. They, you know, I may as well have had car parts or meat <laughs> or something on the table because, because they just didn't get it. And, and, but on the way home in the plane, I was thinking, well, how come all my California friends know about it? And it struck me that they were all surfers. And all the California guys who went to Australia surfing brought three or four pairs of these sheepskin boots back for their buddies. So it was really well known in that market. So we just changed tactics on our marketing and decided to go after the surf shops. Which obviously doesn't seem like that you, no one would have ever put those two together. Yeah. So it, you just take the information that you're given and start. And that's, I think that's the, one of the fundamental concepts of being an entrepreneur is you have a plan. We all have this, you know, they say write a business plan. I'm guessing you didn't have one. I, no. God, I, <laughs> and if I had it, uh, I would have realized I needed two or three hundred thousand dollars to start. So that. <laughs> <laughs> nobody, nobody would know about Ugg boots today if I had done a business plan. Yeah, right. Exactly. Is it? I, and I find these things interesting. Is that sometimes we get ourselves in this situation, or there are individuals who feel like, you know, I can't start until I see the entire process, until I yeah. know what's going to happen from day one to day two to day three. Yeah. yeah. I, I can't. I, I can't take the first step yet. Yeah. I find yeah. so many entrepreneurs have way more success by going as far as they can see today. And trusting that when they get there, they'll be able to see further. Yeah, that's so true. Too much thinking leads to paralysis, exactly what you described. I've seen it so many times. So well, let me ask you this then. What, <laughs> I like how you mentioned it's ignorance or innocence. It's, it's one of the two and probably a combination of both. Yeah. Uh, but Because I, I can totally understand. <laughs> You're like, man, I don't know if I want to. Knowing what I know today, would I still start what I what what we've done? That's a really really good question, you know. Yeah, yeah. but the good news is that the, once you start out on a path, the universe just sort of conspires to work with you. Um, and uh, I, I use this little analogy. You know, you, you never see an advertisement for a refrigerator, right? 
until you want to buy a refrigerator and then <laughs> every single newspaper and every single piece of thing you look at it has ads for newspapers. And that's what it's like with a business when you're starting out. You, you don't know what's out there, but the minute you start, you'll start, all these things will start to come into your perception that has always been there, but it's never until you put the focus on it, like, what do I need to do to learn about customs brokers because I'm going to bring sheepskin boots to California, right? I'd never even heard of customs brokers, but, <laughs> but you know, the universe just supplies the information that you need as you go. So you could be thinking of a real estate deal or, or a new product that you want to do or, or a service. You might want to start a new religion, you know, and, and how do you get the first followers? You, you just got to start. If you don't start, you'll never get anywhere. Well, and you bring that brings us to a very important question because I know, especially with a lot of real estate or business owners, the first time it, when we write that business plan or we have a problem that we think we can solve or a product that we believe other people want, we think we actually know who wants it, but yet yep. we have no clue. So, what was the process like to figure that out? That hey, this is the person we should be going after if we're going to really build something yeah, large. Well, let, let me tell you a story about that because, you know, I, I figured out the surf shops, right? So um, I took the samples around and, and they were going, oh, my God, you're going to be a millionaire. You, those are great. All my friends have got them, you know. And so we, we borrowed nearly $20,000 for our first capital and bought 15, no, 500 pairs of boots in. And when they arrived, we, you know, Doug and I, my buddy, we went out on the road again with all of the product and we went back to the exactly the same shops who told us how rich we were going to be and they, they all said, oh, you know, you, they're great, you know, but we couldn't sell them out of our store because we just sell surfboards and shorts and sandals and, and over and over and over again. So our first year's sales was 28 pairs oh, oh, oh. and it was exactly $1,000. But the thing is you can't get to a billion dollars, which it is now, without that first thousand so you have to start somewhere and for like three years you know we, I, I, we ended up going to the swap meets and if I went surfing up at Malibu I'd open up the back of the van and I had a ton of customers used to come just from the word of mouth and buy product out of the van but you know the first year after that was thirty thousand dollars and we started advertising in surfer magazine and getting these really expensive models and, and putting on the beach with perfect hair and perfect clothing and perfect Ugg boots and sales $30,000. And the next year we got more expensive models and more expensive photographers and the same made them look really pretty on the rocks at the beach and $30,000. And I was in Chicago, you know, because I felt like such a failure I couldn't get into the mall stores. And it was at the buying office of Montgomery Ward, which was a big shoe retailer back then. And I gave the best sales pitch I'd ever given, you know, and he just sat, sort of sat back and looked at me and was silent for a while. And then he said, Brian, we're the elephants. Don't you get it? We don't move till the mice are running around under our feet. And I instantly got what he meant, which was that until I got the specialty stores all, you know, going crazy for it, the mall stores were so risk averse, they were never going to order. So I got back to California and had, had a beer with one of my buddies who owned a surf shop uh, one night. And he, he called out to the back of the room and, and, and uh, said, Hey, you guys, you know, all these little you know, 12, 13 year old grommets were back there. And, and he, what do you guys think of Ugg boots? And they came out and one after the other said, so They were saying, Oh, those Ugg boots, they're so fake, man. Have you seen those ads? Those models can't surf, and I was hit again like this goosebumps <laughs> thing, you know. I was like, oh, my God, I'm sending the wrong image to, to you know, my market. And so within a couple of days, I found these young pro surfers that, that I started sponsoring, and I just used my own camera, followed them to the beach when they were going surfing, you know, wearing their Ugg boots and stuff, and just ran these sort of tacky ads, but they were real, real, you know, classic surf spots every all these surfers would recognize the spots we were you know, photographing and uh we ran those ads this season and, and the sales jumped to two hundred and fifty thousand dollars just purely because of capturing the right image 
And so it's another classic example of, of uh, you know, just just hanging on, hanging on, hanging on until you figure out uh, what the universe is sending. And, 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 you know, when I made that connection, bam, it took it to a whole new level. Well, the, you bring up an interesting point with that is many times we haven't, like you said, we have an idea. We want to go out there. We want to see it succeed immediately. It's only going to go up, right? Everybody yeah. wants this. How do you handle going from that emotional high to 28 pairs? Well, you know, I've learned as in my book, I quote this classic piece of philosophy. The quickest way for a tadpole to become a frog is to live every day happily as a tadpole. And bit by bit, by bit, you keep doing the right thing, keep doing what you think is best for the brand, keep doing, keep trying to push it in, you know, whatever it is you're doing, keep pushing, pushing, pushing. And before you know it, it'll be, you know, you'll find that that one link that just launches you that's like becoming the frog you know yeah and so the interesting thing you're you're really saying just keep <laughs> failing forward in yeah. a very painful way is is what you're saying yeah but but, but be happy about it <laughs> <laughs> that's the book right there failing forward and still smiling yeah <laughs> because because it's just you can't hey, i've got another well the whole theme of my book Mm-hmm. is what I've discovered in business, which is you can't give birth to adults. Every every business is, is conceived by somebody. You know, they have an idea. It doesn't matter if it's a product or a new movie or a you know, religion or a sandwich shop. It doesn't matter. Someone conceives the idea, then they do the first action and that gives birth. For, for my birth, it was buying those six pairs of samples from Australia. Mm-hmm. And then... Every business goes into this horrible infancy and it just seems to lie there. And no matter what you do, it was like me with my 30,000, 30,000, 30,000, right? It just will not get up and go to college. And there's no matter shaking the cradle or overfeeding can make that baby get up and go to college. It has to be an infant. But then it'll hit the toddling stage, which is cool because, you know, people start to get interested and, and you know, uh, uh, people take notice of your product or your or your service, and then eventually you'll hit youth, which is when all this you know the sales are consistent, the orders are coming in, the shipping's happening, the accounting's good, and that's like a kid who can put his own pajamas on and eat at the table you know, without any effort. <laughs> um, and if it's a really good product, it'll hit the teenage years, which like when UG went crazy it just went out of control there for a while just like every teenager and i almost lost control of the business a couple of times during that phase but ultimately the you know the administrators and the the managers start to put the controls in and and uh it becomes a mature business but that's just the way every single business starts and ends you know that's such a great analogy because it, it can it sets the proper expectation yeah. For, for every entrepreneur when, you know, hey, I'm going to start the new year. I'm going to start next month. I'm going to start this week, this brand new thing. And two months from now, it, this is what it's going to look like. Yeah. Uh, not really. Yeah, exactly. I, I can't tell you how many people come up to me after I've given a speech you know, on stage and they'll come up to me almost in tears going, thank you, Brian. I, I I thought I was failing, but now I just see that I'm stuck in this infancy period or or I'm just at the toddling stage or you know, and they really, really get that analogy and it gives them so much hope. Yeah. Well, you gotta give us something because right now we're not getting the sales, right? So we're looking for hope somewhere. Now One of the interesting things that I find uh, specifically as it relates to building a large business is that you're building something that's larger than you. Yeah. Uh, What is that process of growing to that point? Because at first, you know, it's just you and a couple of friends selling stuff out of the backseat of, you know. Yeah. And and then all of a sudden you realize we got to hire somebody. What was that like? That's that's always a problem in a small business, especially if it started without – like, uh, you know, seed capital or, or you like, you know, proper capital because you can never afford to do it, but you can't afford not to. <laughs> right. And uh, it's, a, you know, I mean, I remember hiring our first salesman who he, he, well, he was more of a marketing guy 
And back then, he wanted 4000 a month, and that was a huge amount of money back then for us who had nothing. But we just believed that he could take it and change the, the image of the company, and he did. And we could only afford him for about you know, six months you know, for the season. And, and he took our sales, you know, you know, he started off the ski industry and introduced like a lot of, you know, sexiness into the ads. Uh, and, and it just, it was a catalyst that made the ski industry really attractive. And, uh, that was a huge jump forward, but we couldn't afford him through the summertime because being sheepskin, we only had a three month selling window. Right. And uh, so it's very difficult to keep people on all year round. Uh, most businesses aren't like that. They could bring on somebody that they, you know, that with a consistent sales, they can afford to keep people on. But the, the, I guess what I'm trying to say is that there's no time where you can really afford to bring on new people. But again, you can't afford not to because if you lose your health by working till 10, 10 o'clock or midnight every night, and doing all the details when somebody else could be doing it for 20, 30 bucks an hour, you know, you're working against yourself. Indeed, indeed. And that that's one of the fundamental concepts. I often tell people if it's not worth, like for myself personally, I say if this is not a $1,000 an hour activity, I personally don't need to be doing it. Yeah. Someone else does, which yeah. makes it, well, which the first time you do that, it really clears your calendar because you got nothing else to do because you realize just how many of those small little things that you're doing that you probably shouldn't be. Now, yeah. In the process, especially for me, I know, I remember the first time I, I, I brought on an executive assistant, I was, you know, scared. I'm like, how on earth am I going to feed them too? Right. You know, but at some point, you kind of get used to it, but then you have to learn that there's actually a process to vetting and, and finding the right persons. Be, so I, I guess the question becomes is, how do you do that? How do you know that the person that you are looking at, because yeah, some might say that you were very fortunate to find the salesperson that worked out. Right. But was he the first one or the hundred and first one that you tried? And what did you learn in the process so that you could narrow that down to find the right person faster? Are you tired of letting good cash flow generating ideas go to waste? Go to cashflowdiary.com forward slash ready to apply for a complimentary. Yes, that means free one-on-one -on -one breakthrough session. Take action now. Go to cashflowdiary.com forward slash ready. Again, that's cashflowdiary.com forward slash ready. Before we get back to today's episode of the Cashflow Diary podcast, your host, Jay Massey, has some important insights to share with you. Okay, so here's a question for you. Do you give up too soon? I mean, as you continue to listen to the story here, ask yourself, would you have persevered? At what point would you have quit? When would you have checked out? Where would you have let go and said, it's just too hard, too difficult, can't be done? Oh, well, I guess nobody really, really, really wants sheepskin boots. <laughs> Keep that in mind as you continue to listen to the rest. Well, in this case, it was the first one. Awesome. We learned very quickly that that he wasn't the sort of guy that could uh, we could afford with the business, um, at being as, as seasonal as it was. But eventually, um, we were able to bring in a bunch of sales reps who were free, but they earned a commission, and so that was you know, and we wouldn't have known that had we not gone the other route first. So, so it, again, it's a sort of a learning thing that you go through, but. Uh, one thing that I can talk about with, you know, 20, 30 years of experience in business now is that you've got to just give it your best shot. And I believe a lot in intuition. In fact, my wife used to always have this incredible intuition about people I would hire. She would know if they're good or bad, and I would usually override her, but she was always right. But <laughs> you can always, you just got to go with your gut. But but the, here's the hard part, but it's the most necessary part. If it's not working out within a month or two, you must be strong enough to, to tell them that, hey, it's not working and, and move on, which, again, means don't sign a long-term contract with somebody. You always need a testing period. Indeed. In fact, uh, I can echo that sentiment having made that same mistake. I, I'm 
curious, um, for me, I know for me, I learned that by having to deal with individuals longer than I should have. Um, right. Is that I'm assuming that that was a similar yeah. instance for you? Yeah. Oh, over and over again. Yeah. And that's why I said it's with 20 or 30 years experience. Yeah. For the first 10 years, I didn't learn the lesson. <laughs> you know, even, though, even though my wife was beating me over the head, um, I didn't learn the lesson. But now, now it's the case of you have to be sort of ruthless and, and know that your business comes first. You know, what's funny about that is I often tell people that I I will bring my wife to certain meetings for not necessarily for her business input, although that's valued. It's, hey, just tell me how you feel about this person. Yeah. And I do that all the time. And I have learned very, very painfully to listen to what I call the willies. Every time she gets to the willies, she's like, ah, I just don't like you. Can you tell me why? Nope, just don't feel good. All right, great. And that, And I've learned to listen no matter the cost. Because you have to, it's it's oh. wisdom. It's wisdom that they have that guys just don't. Yeah, what is that? That's like so not fair. <laughs> <laughs> it's just so not fair. Now, uh, well, we, we can throw a football there. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, that that that's truly that makes up for it. <laughs> the, the the one of the interesting things that I do find about business, though, and especially would be uh, entrepreneurs, is that we let minor things stop them. At the beginning of this episode, I simply said that no one has a money problem, but you might have an idea problem. Yeah. It, from my experience and in, in most businesses that I've run into, there are times where cash is tight, something happens, you didn't expect this, and everything is going smoothly, and then all of a sudden, bam, you've got to figure it out. Yep. Uh, what were some of those times for you, and how did you guys come up with the ideas to figure that out? Well, um, you can imagine with having three months of sales every year and, and nine months, you know, the first three or four years I lived off credit cards in the summer and got, you know, jobs in construction or, you know, one year I was washing boats at Marina del Rey, another year I was working on a golf course, you know. Um, so they're the, they're the tough times when you run out of cash and, the as we moved forward and I started getting capital where it could keep me through the, the summertime, you just have to get creative and uh, and try and and you know figure out if there's a way for like I started offering big discounts for uh, getting rid of inventory that was left over and, and stuff like that. So it's there's no it's hard it's a hard a hard question to answer when I don't know the type of business. Uh, that everybody you know, has out there in your listening audience, but it it really comes down to creativity. Yeah, I, I agree one hundred percent. And when it when those creative moments come, uh, I guess was there ever a time in which you decided to to bring in additional capital from outside investors to make things work? Yeah, I'll tell you. Ready for another story? Yeah, by all means. Okay, this was a rather desperate period for me, and and, and my book. You know, it's a lot of highs, but it's a lot more lows and how I overcame them, you know, which is normal for every business. Well, um, I built the business up to a couple of million dollars, but each time, you know, you get investors in, the, they really have the ability to run with you so far, but but if the business is doubling like mine was, it was two million looking like it was going to be three and a half, four, they didn't have the ability to stick with it and finance the growth. So we'd end up buying them out. And, and in this case, I bought in three new investors uh, and we were all going to go 25% each on the business. My quarter was for bringing the business in. And I paid off my old investor. And uh, there, was a, there was one proviso. I didn't get my 25% till I finished up this little trademark lawsuit that I was in with another company that spelled their name UGHS. And so, you know, I went in and I was, the, uh, they made me the, the sales rep for Southern California. Well, right after that transaction happened, uh, the very first day I was out on the road, I went down to Huntington Surf and Sport and, and I walked in and the, and the, uh, the guy says, hey, Brian, I heard you sold the, went, what? Hmm. He said, yeah, I just called an order and they said you don't own it anymore. And I said, you're kidding me, what? And I couldn't wait to finish. I went next door to the Shell gas station to the phone booth because this is before cell phones. <laughs> and 
And I went, called up and said, Neil, what the hell are you telling anybody? He says, well, you don't own the business, Brian. I said, yes, I do. You're my three new partners. And they said, no, that's not what the contract says. And and I just went straight back home to San Diego and, and, and pulled out the contract and I went, oh, my God, they're right. And I realized I'd, I'd given up the, the company. and But I didn't know it until I actually read that. And I went into depression for a couple of couple of days, you know, and wondering if you know I'm going to be a business broker or real estate or you know start a franchise or what. And and it came to me in a meditation that I I just love sales, you know. And then I thought, well, okay, what can I sell? And the answer was pretty obvious. I loved Ugg boots and I loved the industry and I loved all my retailers. So so I just ate humble pie and I just went back as a non-owner and started being the sales rep and hanging out with all the retailers, you know, and fixing up their inventories. And and by now they were all becoming friends, so it wasn't like hard selling or anything. And after a month I got back to the warehouse and Neil handed me a check for $5,000 and he said, that's your commissions for the month. And I went, you're kidding me. I, I had not drawn a cent out of the business till that time. And the next month there was a check for ten thousand, and the next month another check for ten thousand dollars, and I started looking at this, going, well, "My God, I haven't done any shipping, any billing, any purchasing, any administration. I haven't done. I've just been out having fun with all my retailers, and you know, delivering products and making sure inventory is correct. And and I thought, and I'm making all this money, and. And that led me to to a piece of philosophy that's in my book, which is most often your most disappointing disappointments become your greatest blessings. Hmm. And if you could imagine how despondent I was at one point to where I'm on this euphoria of, of, of being in my business, loving it, and making a ton of money, it, it was really a, one of the greatest blessings I had. And and by a pure fluke, uh, a couple of years later, I got the business back a hundred percent. So, you never you never know what's in store because the universe has it all planned, and you just got to play your part. You know that? Yeah, that is. I I don't know that many people would have responded the way that you you did. I mean, especially after putting in all that work to, yeah. to get it to be something, anything, functioning and breathing entity, and then to realize in such a way. Uh, that you did something unknowingly. Yeah. Uh, it, I, wow. I, wow. Amazing. So yeah. this, this brings up an interesting point. You, you got it back, but then you sold it again. Yeah. I got it back because uh, Neil, this guy had, had uh, bought his other two partners out and then he was at a motocross race and had a massive heart attack and died. So I, I worked with his widow to try and, Mm. Trying, you know, figure out where the business was, and it was the longest six months of my life. Right, and uh, I, uh, you know, I, I, I was commuting from San Diego to Anaheim uh, five days a week for. And after about three weeks, that got too hard, so I got the train up on Mondays and came back on Fridays. I, I was working so late that I got to know the midnight shift at Bob's Big Boy Diner, you know, and <laughs> and, uh, and I was chronically sore throat every Friday night when I got home and, and next Monday it was just like just good enough to go back again and uh, you know I, luckily I was an accountant so I was able to figure out all of the thing and, and it turned out that you know the company had made a loss um, and whereas we all thought it was really profitable because we'd bought life insurance policies and new cars and all that Neil and I did and uh, anyway it turned out that um, the the life insurance policy that we took out just before he died paid off and it was enough for me to buy the business back from his widow and it was a great deal. We just switched the names on the original contract when they bought it from me. We just changed the names around and did exactly the same terms. So it was a very easy deal and suddenly I had 100% of the business back. Wow. Amazing. Pretty amazing. Yeah. Amazing. So and how many years before – uh, so how many years, uh, has it, you, you transpire all these things and then someone approaches you to say, Hey, we, we want to, we want to buy it. 
Well, that's a really good story too. Um, remember when I was selling the boots out of the back of the van at Malibu? Right. There was another guy called Doug Otto, and he was always a couple of vans up, you know, parking spaces up, and he was selling these triple-decker sandals. You know, they were neoprene thongs with pink and yellow and pink, and they were about three inches tall, but just little fl- little thong styles. And uh, he ended up building a business called Deckers out of that thing. Hmm. And he eventually, you know, he licensed a t- ton of products that he sold, and he eventually got a, a sandal called Teva, and he took his company public on that Teva or Teva sandal, and uh, he had you know twenty, thirty million bucks in the bank. I, I don't know how much it was, but it was, it was a lot of money. And I had built the UG business up to about or oh, fifteen million. It looked like it could be twenty, and it was one of those periods where we'd grown so fast. I I really didn't have any idea how to finance it because you know when i started out with a hundred thousand in sales the you know the the manufacturer would cover me and then when it got to you know two million uh then you know there was receivables financing and stuff that would you know when the manufacturer would cover me again but when you get up in the you know the 10 15 million they want to know they have they have security which means you have to have a huge cash flow and an asset base behind you, which I which I didn't because we spent so much in the summertime just staying alive. And back then it was the, all the investment bankers and the regular bankers, every, every time I'd take a business plan to that was, ah, oh, Ugg's a fad, it won't be around next year. <laughs> and, and I could never, it, now this is 15 years after I'd started, they're still saying, yeah, but it's a fad, it's a shoe, you know, it, it may not be around next year. So I couldn't get traditional financing for it. And uh, it was just, you know, anyway, this season when I had the $15 million in sales, I was going off to a, uh, uh, a trade show in Atlanta, which is called the Super Show, and it's it's one of the biggest shows in the country for sporting goods, and and we had a pretty big you know sporting good business going, and I arrived there in the baggage claim, and way down the other end was Doug Otto, and I instantly <laughs> got, I instantly got goosebumps again, and and you've heard me talk about goosebumps, you know, to me like I'm a very spiritual person, and to me that's my inner being, you know, my my little spirit inside me telling me, Brian, you're on the right track. And, and every time I felt goosebumps in that way, I, I just, I used to sort of think it's weird, but now I just accept that that's my, my little helper telling me, yep, go for it. You're on the right track. So, so anyway, I, I walked down the concourse, uh, at the baggage claim and Doug saw me and we smiled and high fived each other. And I said, Doug, you know, if ever we're going to get these businesses together, cause you know, our business died every summer his business died every winter, and mm. it was a perfect match. And he he tried to approach me before about buying it, but I, I used to, you know, joke you, hey, Doug, you can't afford me, you know. <laughs> um, but since he'd gone public and he had all this cash, it, it was like it was a good way for me to go public without having to go public. You know, I just right. ca- cashed out, and w- which was fantastic for me because I am a, a real entrepreneur. I love starting businesses. I hate being in big companies. Mm. I can't, you know, I if I have to sit in a committee meeting oh. deciding on what product and what color to do and you've got 15 people who all want to get their say in and then you end up instead of having either brown or, or, or black, you end up with this horrible color in the middle because everybody compromises, you know, and uh, – I just can't stand that. So it was perfect timing for me to cash out. And, you know, the company was, you know, you know, 15 million in, in orders. So that was, a, that was a, I, I felt like I, I'd taken it as far as I could go. Yeah. Yeah. That totally makes a, a lot of sense right there. I love the uh, understanding how you each complemented one another and being able to solve the, the respect of others' problems at that yeah. particular moment in time. That's a very useful skill. So since, you know, all of these things, I guess one of the really interesting questions that I would want to know is why take the time to document this in, in a book? Tell us about it. Well, I, I love, 
I love entrepreneurs and, and this is my way to give back. And, you know, I, I mentioned, you know, those people come up, coming up to me after I get off stage and, and each one that tells me that, that I've helped them is just like, you know, it's more than money. I, I can't explain it, but it means more to me than money. And I, I just want entrepreneurs like the, there's like so many people that I meet that go, oh, yeah, I've got this idea, but I don't know how to get a business license. And, and I go, give me a break. You know, I've, I've <laughs> never had a business license, you know, and, and they get held up by such stupid reasons, you know, the stupid fears. And really it's just procrastination. And so my book is like a, a wake-up call for entrepreneurs and it's a, it's a great roadmap for those who have already started and are going through the blues of that infancy or toddling stages. And, uh, it, and, and on top of that, it's full of, you know, my philosophy and stories and, you know, a, it's just a really, really good read. Nice, nice. Now, what would you say – to that person or persons for that matter, who are thinking for the first time, you know, I, I got an idea. I think it has legs. I'm not sure. Um, but I want to start, but I, I'm a little afraid. What would you say to that, to that person who's thinking about putting on their superhero outfit for the very first time in their life and actually taking on other people's problems? Okay. Uh, first of all, if they, if they've already employed, uh, don't quit your job. <laughs> okay. Keep, begin your business, right? Begin it at night, on the weekends, I don't care when, lunch hours. Begin your business and, and keep your old job because it's such a comfort to know that you can pay the rent every month. Um, whereas I jumped into this just 100% and, and I had like a little bit of money from a house that I'd sold when I came to America. So I didn't bother getting a job, but I was forced to, to have to stay alive. So the first thing is stay alive. Start your business and don't be afraid of uh, making mistakes. You don't have to know where you're going when you start because it'll just, it'll just evolve. And the other thing I'd say is that the, the best piece of advice I got when, when, before I found UGS, uh, before I even came to America, I had a buddy who had a really successful uh, small boat building business and and he always seemed to be in control of things and and I said Rich what do you how do you know what to do with your life and and he came back and said Brian find out what it is you can do better than anybody else and do it because if you if you are the best money will chase you and you'll be and you'll enjoy what you're doing and be happy and uh, and you know, the reason why you don't have to know where you're going is that as you, as you move forward, as each, each step you take, you'll say, oh, my God, I could have done it this way or it would have been better had I done it that way. And that's how you grow. You, you never – it's like not a linear small to large. It's, it's like you cruise along flat and you hit an obstacle like a plateau, you have to climb up over that obstacle and then you're cruising along flat on the next level and you'll hit another obstacle and when you get over that one, you're cruising along at a higher level and before you know it, you'll be way, way, way up there. And But it's never been a straight run. It's always been little little things that, that jolt you up into the next level and, and it has to be an obstacle or else there's no growth. Indeed, indeed. Now, for those of us who want to hear more from you or find your book or, or understand what you are up to next, what's the best way for us to get in contact with you? Okay, through my website it's, or my email address. It's, uh, the website is briansmithspeaker.com with a B-R-I. Um, and uh, my email is brian at briansmithspeaker.com. And uh, that way you can check out my, my book page. If you want to buy a book, that links to Amazon. Or if you're uh, looking for speaking, you know, if you, if you want me to come and speak to your group, I'd love to do that. And uh, then there's also a little coaching component to it if uh, somebody's stuck uh, and needs to sort of get a little nudge over some problems or, or you know, wants to start out, then, then I do have a coaching program as well. Excellent, sir. Well, I do want to say 
I definitely appreciate you taking the time to invest with us here today at the Cashflow Diary audience. Great. Well, I hope I've been a, an inspiration to your audience. I do believe you have, sir. Thank you very much. Great. My pleasure. All right, ladies and gentlemen, you know what time it is? It is time for you to move at the speed of instruction. So what does that mean today? That probably means go pick up a copy of The Birth of a Brand because you know what? I've learned some things today and I know this. You may have a business right now, as he said, in its infancy, toddling along. Don't quit. Keep pushing forward. You will continue to mature and grow up. I look forward to talking to you guys soon. Until next time. 